So I'm going to talk to you today about the drive of the female mosquito to do this, to get our blood, to be able to get the necessary nutrients to produce the next generation. So this is just a normal day in my lab. One of my students, Emily Dennis, who's very good at being bitten, has inserted her arm into a cage with female mosquitoes. They instantly detect that there is a one inch diameter piece of human skin, live skin. They land, they probe, they bite, they puncture the skin, and then they have a pumping mechanism where they drink extremely deeply of the blood. And so you can see them in this video sped up 10 times, doubling their body weight. So this is the biggest of biggest gulps. And so why do they do this? Because without this source of nutrients, they're effectively sterile. So if you think about it from their point of view, they're not trying to spread diseases to us, they're just trying to do their day job to get the necessary nutrients to give birth to their babies. And again, come up at the end, we have live mosquito babies at the front, and some of them hatched in the last 10 minutes. So what happens if you look underneath the skin when you're being bitten? This beautiful movie from a group at the Pasteur Institute. This is the stylet, the syringe or organ um, that is uh, puncturing the skin. And you can see this female is driving the stylet, trying to identify a little capillary that she can puncture with this stylet which she does now. So it's an unbelievable behavior. Just like when you go to the doctor, you get a blood draw, this female has found a capillary. You can see it getting pinched by the intensity of the pumping mechanism. And in about two minutes, she'll have then doubled her body weight. She'll remove the stylet, fly off, and then use that blood to be able to produce her babies. And so this, of course, causes massive problems. Somebody at the beginning asked me, uh, what are mosquitoes for? Why do they exist? Why should they exist on Earth? This is just, you know, they're just feeding on us again to get nutrients. As a part of that, these microorganisms, viruses, and uh, pathogens like malaria are hitchhiking onto this behavior. So, of course, the mosquito we study, Aedes aegypti, is a vector for yellow fever, dengue. Chikungunya, which is a disease that came to this hemisphere only three years ago and is now endemic in South and Central America. And then most recently, Zika, which was sort of an under-the-radar virus that nobody worked on. The NIH had not spent a dollar on Zika research until just a few months ago because it was sort of an incidental viral disease limited to Africa. And so here's just the history of how Zika virus spread around the world. And it was first documented in um, 1947. And it spread a little bit around in Africa for, for the next 15 years, causing a very mild fever, a little bit of a viral flu. It then started migrating around the world. So how do viruses migrate around the world? It's not that mosquitoes are flying across the Indian Ocean, it's that humans are flying across the Indian Ocean and they bring these viruses with them. And everywhere you go in the tropics, there are mosquitoes waiting to feed on humans. Again, this is how they get the nutrients to, uh, to be reproductively functional. And so if an infected human comes, then the disease very rapidly spreads locally. Viruses are also in the business of mutating, and so they're constantly changing, which is why it's very difficult to develop vaccines. In some cases, the virus is constantly changing the rules. And so what happened, um, as you read in the press, is that as Zika virus made its way around the Earth, it started to accumulate probably mutations that caused, at the time that it arrived in French Polynesia and then in Brazil, where the virus changed its lifestyle to attack human cortical progenitor cells. So to be very, very selective, um, if a mother is infected with Zika virus in the first trimester, she has a hugely elevated risk of giving birth to a child with serious neural defects. And so we sort of, as, as scientists and epidemiologists, watch this emerging like a horrible car crash, just emerging. You see it moving so, spreading so rapidly through Brazil, and it was spreading up through um, Mexico, um, through the entire Caribbean, and, and then landed very recently on our shores. And this is what everybody is afraid of. So a case where the virus or the pathogen isn't just making you sick as a human who's been bitten by a mosquito, you're actually endangering the next generation. So, um, so this is why it's so important to understand that transaction, how the female finds humans, lands, probes, bites, punctures the skin, um, is really, really important to, to the beginning of these diseases which start with a bite. And just a little side note is that just a few months ago, 
the CDC issued its first ever travel advisory for the United States, right? If you are a pregnant woman, do not travel to the entirety of Miami-Dade County, including some major tourist areas. And then just about six weeks ago, there are travel advisories for Brownsville, Texas. So Zika isn't just coming on airplanes, it's now locally being transmitted. Again, there's mosquitoes waiting around for their blood meal. And if an infected human happens to come along, then the viral disease will start to spread locally. So again, this is an important problem. Mosquitoes in the lineup of the world's deadliest animals. If I ask people what's the, most, the world's most deadly animal, you might say, okay, it's going to be a crocodile that eats a lot of people, or elephants stomp on people, or sharks. If you're a surfer, sharks are terrifying. Um, but in fact, humans, of course, are very dangerous. So 475,000 humans every year are killed by humans. But about twice as many are killed by mosquitoes. So mosquitoes do remain the, the number one biggest killers of humans on Earth. And my laboratory wishes to understand how they do what they do. And so we're sensory neurobiologists. We're interested really in this first step when a mosquito approaches a human. We do things that make us incredibly attractive, that we can't stop doing. So look at you, you're so beautiful, you're wearing all these beautiful, high contrasting clothes. And that makes you, and you're usually moving, even if you're adjusting in your seat, the high acuity vision of the mosquito can sense that, that there's something interesting there. Moreover, so those are the visual cues, moreover, we stink, right? So you, you can't smell it, but even if you've showered, you stink. So each of us sitting here is producing this beautiful perfume of human odor, sort of a, a conversation between the microbiome on our skin that feeds on the secretions of the skin to produce these volatile odorants that mosquitoes are acutely sensitive to. So it doesn't really matter how much you wash or how much perfume you wear or if you wear deodorant, the mosquitoes can still smell you. So they're acutely sensitive to human odor which we can't do much about, again, because it doesn't matter how much Chanel number no. 95 you put on, doesn't matter. So, and carbon dioxide, another thing that we can't stop doing, every time we exhale, we're pumping 4% carbon dioxide into the air. One of the most potent ways to activate a mosquito is to squirt it with a little bit of carbon dioxide. So if you're walking around locally, chit-chatting, you're basically fumigating the area with carbon dioxide. Any mosquito that may be resting will be aroused, fly around, and then use these cues to find you. And then the last cue is heat. So we're all warm-blooded animals. If I had one of these heat-sensitive cameras and I pointed it at you, each of us would be billowing forth with um, heat that makes us uh, contrast with the local environment. So there isn't much that we can do to try to uh, avoid these creatures. So we've become interested in the lab in this fundamental problem about how the disease-carrying insects actually learn to specialize on humans. So a big key in how dangerous the malaria mosquito is, is that the malaria mosquito selectively hunts humans. A big reason that Zika spreads so quickly is that the vector mosquito, Aedes aegypti, here at the front of the stage, selectively bites humans. So they really only bite people. And even though other animals would provide perfectly suitable sources of blood, you don't, there's nothing really particularly special about human blood, they just have learned to specialize on us. And so here's the kind of experiments that we do in the lab um, on the Upper East Side to ask a mosquito, would you prefer the smell of my, po my former postdoc, Lindy McBride, now a professor at Princeton, or would you rather enjoy the smell of a guinea pig? So this is a fundamental test of, is this the thing that matters to mosquitoes? Is it the smell of these two creatures, right? It could be that the, the guinea pig is the motion of the guinea pig or the way the guinea pig looks or the heat that it gives off is what, is what makes um, these animals attractive. So the talk is gonna center in a moment on genome editing with CRISPR-Cas9 as a mechanism to eradicate mosquitoes. We've been using it as a tool in the laboratory to understand mosquitoes. So we have gone through and step by step generated mosquitoes that can't smell human odor, that can't smell carbon dioxide, and that have an altered relationship with sensing heat to ask the question of which of these cues really matters for them in their hunting behavior. 
And so what we've done is just using that assay that I showed where Lindy's arm is on one side and the guinea pig is on the other, we ask, what is the preference of these mosquitoes that spread Zika? So if you get a score of one, it means 100% of the mosquitoes have flown toward the human. A score of minus one, 100% of the mosquitoes prefer the guinea pig. And you can see that the bars are all the way pinned to the right. Aedes aegypti is extremely, extremely attracted to humans and doesn't have much interest in the guinea pig. So how important is the sense of smell in making this discrimination? So we've used genome editing to eliminate a very important gene called ORCO. So ORCO is at the foundation of about half of the sense of smell of all insects. Removing this one gene of the 14,000 genes in the genome will take half of their sense of smell offline. And so you can see in the two bars at the bottom that these mutants, they still are attracted to humans, but they're also attracted to guinea pigs. So they've lost this specialization to be highly attracted to humans. So this is some strong evidence that, that they really do care about human sense. So if we could magically all smell like guinea pigs, of course, that would be really helpful. I don't have any <clears throat> specific advice about how to get that to work. So that's all about my work. So um, what I really came to talk to you about is, is um, what are we going to do about this? So, we can't stop breathing, we can't stop being warm-blooded, we can't stop smelling the way we smell, um, can't live indoors, we can't, you know, there's just a lot of problems. So how do we stop mosquitoes from hunting and killing us? So we have a couple of possible, possible options, but they really aren't good enough. So you could purchase these products, which contain high concentrations of a molecule called DEET or Picaridin. To prevent yourself from being bitten, you would have to apply these products every four hours to 100% of all exposed surfaces of your skin, even when you're sleeping. And they're only 95% effective, even if you do that. And so it's just not plausible for the 3 billion people on Earth who are susceptible to these diseases to actually put this stuff on. Another option which has been extremely effective is sleeping under bed nets. So I think a lot of the decrease in mortality from about a million a year to about 600,000 a year is due to the huge injection of philanthropy into bed net distribution. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation really have put their money behind eradicating malaria. It's had a huge impact. Now, what are the problems with bed nets? Why don't we just have all three billion people in these areas sleep under bed nets? It's extremely uncomfortable to sleep under bed nets in the tropics. It's just really unpleasant. Anyone who's done it, very unpleasant because whatever the heat is, it just gets more focused. Another problem is that mosquitoes are very tiny, and so if you have a little tear in the bed net, they're going to find it, and they're going to go in and bite you. So it has to be completely pristine. Now, there's mechanisms that um, people have used to dip these in insecticide that makes them more effective. So you dip them in insecticide, they'll be a little bit more effective. If there's a little tear, you get a little bit more. Now, a problem that's emerged only recently, which is causing Thailand's malaria to increase again, is that the mosquitoes are being put under a lot of pressure. They are not getting their blood meals because they're flying around at night. Anopheles mosquitoes hunt at night, so they're, they're in the houses trying to find people. All the people are sleeping under bed nets, so they're not getting the blood, so they don't reproduce. This is causing very rapid selection for mosquitoes that have a different lifestyle. So they feed in the afternoon. So they feed when people are not underneath the bed nets. And so you start selecting for those populations. So there's been a shift from night biting mosquitoes to late afternoon biting mosquitoes, which obviously you're not going to walk around with a bed net around you. And so this subtle shift in the behavior of the mosquito is making these um, significantly less efficacious. And then finally, get trucks or airplanes and spray poison, neurotoxins. Very effective. The neurotoxins are very good at killing mosquitoes. They also kill, they're not specific to mosquitoes. These are neurotoxins that will kill any animal with a nervous system. They also caused enormous environmental problems. DDT is taken off the market in many places in the world because of terrible environmental side effects. Current insect repellents are much better, but the mosquito, again, finds a way around it. So if you kill 99.9% .9 of mosquitoes in your local area with um, a new insect repellent, the 0.01% survive, and they then go out and bite, and they reproduce. So 
Current new insect repellents, you have about five or 10 years before mass resistance breaks out. So each of these, the bug spray is inconvenient, the bed nets, the mosquito is starting to bite, not at night, and the insecticides start to fail really quickly because of resistance. Um, so what should we do? Should we just kill all of them? So this has been tried before. There's some challenges. So there's dozens of different mosquito species that spread disease. They're in all tropical and subtropical re regions, and they live amongst us. So how are you going to go in and eradicate? We've tried this before successfully. So in the US, the screwworm, an agricultural pest that um, caused about a billion dollars of losses in livestock a year, was successfully eradicated in 1965. This is a really horrible creature, too. Here's the mom. Here's the baby. So the mom lays the eggs in wounds of livestock. The eggs then turn into larvae, and you get these horrible postulating sores. So a major, major problem. So what was the solution? Sterile insect techniques. You rear billions and billions of screwworm pupae. You irradiate them. Here's the pupae. You have this production line where you take the pupae. This is this great stock photo from the 50s when this was done. You then irradiate them, put them in these really intense um, uh, radiation devices so that you sterilize them. Radiation is a really effective way to sterilize everything from bacteria to humans. So, so the animals survive this. So then what happens? You load them onto airplanes where you have all of these animals that are sterile, but they look like screwworm females. So the females and males are dropped from the airplanes, and they mingle with the local screwworm flies, and they mate with them. Every female who mates with a sterile male, because they mate only once in life, so if she picks a sterile male, that's it. So she'll never produce progeny. So you keep doing this day after day, week after week, month after month for several decades. And then you get eradication. So it took 10 years to eradicate screwworm from the eastern US. Um, and so we were sort of done by 1966. But there's screwworm all throughout Mexico and Central America. And whatever anybody says about a wall having any effects, <laughs> it's not enough to just hope that the screwworm doesn't come across the borders. And so eradication by the USDA had to spread throughout these areas. So this was pretty good. We eradicated a species from the lower 48 states. But look, two months ago, it was back. So the eradication that, that held for 30 years already failed. So it's incredibly difficult to use these. It, the idea works, irradiation works, but you have to be constantly vigilant. So the new idea is, should we just engineer mosquitoes to eradicate themselves? How about that? They can go into the areas where they normally live. They could mingle with each other and, um, and eradicate themselves. And here's where the star of the show comes in. This is CRISPR-Cas9. This is a three-year-old technology that will and has already revolutionized all areas of biology and medicine and agriculture. This is where our new crops will come from, our new cures, and our new scientific discoveries. This is just a cartoon of how it works. You have a protein machine that is guided to a particular gene in the genome by the blue guide RNA that locks onto the gene, and then the Cas9 protein cuts it. And so you can destroy genes, you can put new genes in. And what has happened, this idea that has been um, tested in the lab for the last 10 years and is close to being implemented, is that you break all of the rules of Mendelian inheritance, by using CRISPR-Cas9 to put a female infertility gene into a population. So if there's an essential gene that females, female mosquitoes need to be fertile, you just break it. So you take a mutant female, so you take the thing at the top, is you mutate this one gene using CRISPR-Cas9, and through some trickery, that gene is copied over onto the other chromosome. You then mate that female, normally the genes would assort. You would have like the mom, one copy of the mom will go here, the other copy would go there. But no, this gene drive mechanism breaks the rules, and so you end up, every time you have a female carrying that gene, all of her children inherit it. So it's an incredibly effective way to push these sterility mechanisms, not by irradiating them by the billions, but start with a small number of females that carry this infertility gene, and after a certain amount of time, in theory, 
by the modeling, that infertility gene will start to go through the population. And so that's sort of shown there. Whenever a female inherits two bad copies of the gene, she'll be completely infertile, she'll produce no children. The male is fine, he'll go on and mate with other females and eventually start to crash the population. And that's sort of modeled here. As the line is rising to the right, four generations of mosquitoes is about um, two months. So in two months, you should start to see this whole um, population replacement where all the mosquitoes that are born, the females are sterile and the males are carrying a female sterilizing gene. So it has the possibility, it's working in the laboratory, it's working in limited field trials, um, and it would have a lot of benefits, right? You'd be able to send the mosquito out to basically murder itself, just eradicate its own population. Okay, so what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> Why don't we just do this right now? It seems so perfect. The lab, you know, CRISPR, CRISPR the greatest thing, the lab, the modeling, it should work. So what could possibly go wrong? I think that there's three different scenarios that people talk about. I mean, I have a strong opinion. I'd be interested in hearing your opinion. The first is we don't really know what is going to go wrong. When you delete a species, and in this case, you'd have to delete 30 species because it isn't just one disease vectoring mosquito, you eliminate a lot of um, insect biomass that bats and insectivorous birds eat. So. Now, could they find other sources of food? Probably, the, the Earth has some resilience in it, but this is a major problem. Those of you watching bats, even in Central Park, hunting at night, they, they, do, they clear a lot of mosquitoes from, from the air, and they're gonna go hungry. The other thing that is uh, mentioned is that mosquitoes are pollinators, to a limited extent. We're not talking honeybees or butterflies. This is a male mosquito. Male mosquitoes do not bite us. Male mosquitoes uh, drink from nectar from flowers, and they have a limited role as pollinators. Maybe we don't know, maybe they have a major role as pollinators of plants that we didn't anticipate until we eradicated them, and then, then we have a problem. And I think the final issue that, I mean, I have no idea what happens if you take CRISPR-Cas9 gene drive system and drive a female infertility gene through a mosquito population. I can't guarantee that it's not gonna jump to other insects. There are other ideas out there to take um, a death gene that is very effective at killing mosquitoes. If you just don't want to mess with infertility, just kill them. You can use gene drive to drive a death gene called HID. HID is a death gene that kills cells. It will kill our cells. It's very, very efficient at killing all cells. So I can't guarantee that a gene drive mechanism loaded with a payload of HID isn't going to get out of hand. So, I think we're at this, we're at the brink where the technology is incredible. It works beautifully in the lab. On the one hand, you have animals who are killing um, hundreds of thousands of people every year, sickening hundreds of millions of people, affecting many, many um, sectors of life on Earth. And we have this promise of this technology just to delete these animals, but there are risks. And so with that, I'm gonna stop. <laughs>